please join in the responsive call to worship. They shall come from north and south and east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of heaven. We drink come from near and far, drawn to your gracious banquet table, O Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. You may be seated. In spite of God's love for us and the gift of love to us, we often act in destructive and hateful ways. We close our hearts to God and disobey God's laws. Together, let us confess our sin, praying together the prayer of confession. In the waters of baptism, O oh God, you have cleansed us and claimed us. Forgive us for resisting your grace and for tarnishing your divine image. We have followed our own paths and they have led us far away from you. But in your perfect love, you have come in search of us to restore us unto yourself. We are grateful to you, O oh God, for your steadfast faithfulness and your patient mercy. We are grateful that you look upon us not with wrath, but with divine favor and with a grace that exceeds our imaginations. With this gift of new life, with this new beginning, we will seek to serve, honor, and glorify you, not by our strength, but by your prayer work in us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The past is finished and gone. Everything becomes fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to this time of worship this day. We're grateful for your presence here with us as we worship God together. Hope all of you also will sign the friendship pads as they are passed back and forth along the pew so you can know who is seated alongside you. This also gives us a record of you being here with us today. On the back of the bulletin, you'll see various announcements. Please take note of those. A reminder to um, Presbyterian men of their meeting tomorrow night and a reminder to all of you, hopefully you have seen uh, announcements about this, about uh, our, our church's birthday celebration, which will take place in a couple of weeks uh, on a Sunday morning. This is being uh, this effort to celebrate our birth and to do so on an annual basis led by our Presbyterian Foundation, our church's foundation, and we're grateful to the leadership they're providing. But everybody loves a birthday, except their own, of course, and so... Uh, um, we'll, it'll be fun for us to celebrate the birthday of First Presbyterian Church in just a couple of weeks. A reminder to uh, uh, high school youth and their parents about an important mission trip meeting that will take place immediately following this service, and I assume it's up either in the senior high room or uh, in the Ed Greer room across the hall, but up in the uh, second floor of the Ed Stock building. You see uh, listed there the uh, commissioning of a New Orleans mission team. We, uh, uh, in, a, in about a week, actually many of them will be leaving next Sunday, a group of our folks will be headed to New Orleans to spend a week working there, still uh, helping that community uh, recover from the damage inflicted by the Hurricane Katrina. Uh, but this is the only Sunday uh, we would be able to gather together to commission them. So I'm going to ask, call them forward so that you can get a look at them and so uh, I've got a question I'm going to pose to them and one to you and then we will send them on their way with our prayers. If, if the members of this mission team will come forward and stand in the front of the church as I call their names. Uh, Ann Carter, Betty Ann Dorman and Marvin Dorman, Bill Spencer, Boyd Devon, Carol Ann Mooring, Joe Salisbury. Two members of our group are keeping the nursery this morning so that we are commissioning them from some distance, Kathy Sommerfeld and Lean Morton, uh, Melanie Taylor and Bill Taylor, Nat Sparrow, Mike Austin, Pat Nicholson, Rob Fields, Peggy and Wayne Campbell. And I see that Pat Nicholson's sister, Debbie Finley, is going. Is Debbie here? Not here. Debbie's from Fayetteville, and Debbie is actually taking the place of Dot Smith, who very much wanted to go, but uh, is now unable to go. So uh, we're, we're glad your, your numbers are complete. Most of these folks will leave next Sunday morning and return the following Saturday. Uh, Wayne and Peggy will actually go a few days earlier. The incentive they have is they've got grandchildren in the New Orleans area, so they, uh, they're going to add a little bit uh, of uh, pleasure to this, to this mission trip. The writer of Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a time to tear down and a time to build up. In choosing to go on a mission trip to New Orleans, you are going to a place where tearing down and building up will be going on for some time. You represent our third trip 
to New Orleans. Uh, some of you went on our trip about a year ago, and then uh, many of our senior high young people went over the summer. Those of you who have been before will need to guard yourself against the discouragement that might come when you realize that even after a year and a half, there is still so much to be done. But hopefully that will confirm your decision to return and to invite new folks to come with you to be a witness again of the love of Christ. Jesus tells us to go into all the world making disciples, and you are not necessarily going on an evangelistic mission. I don't think you plan to have a tent revival or give lectures on Christian theology, but that doesn't mean you won't be making disciples. Because when members of the body of Christ go into a community of need and hurt and show forth the love of God, we cannot predict how others will respond to that and be drawn to that. And so even though this is not technically an evangelistic mission, you will be showing the love of Christ to a community in need of it. And so we hope your own discipleship will be nourished and enriched, and we imagine that others will too. As you prepare to leave, I have a question for you. Is it your intention to represent First Presbyterian Church and our Lord Jesus Christ in and among the people of New Orleans, seeking to bear witness to the love and compassion of God and as a sign of hope for the people there? If so, please say yes by God's grace. Yes, by God's grace. And for the congregation, do you commit to pray for these missionaries, to pray God's blessing upon them and God's blessing to pour forth through them? If so, please say, we do. We do. Let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, we give you thanks that you have stirred in the hearts of these disciples, that they have answered your call to discipleship, to serve you in a place where there is much work to be done. We give you thanks, O oh God, for leading this for being present with them as a source of strength and encouragement. We pray that you will guide and direct them, equip them, and mostly make yourself known through them. Keep them safe, O oh God, return them safely to us, that we might learn of their good work and give glory to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. Others you might want to keep in your prayers in the coming week. Uh, former staff person Joyce McFarland is uh, still at Rex Hospital this morning. She has pneumonia and had some blood sugar issues, but she was doing better Friday, and her uh, daughters were by her side. She's in intensive care at Rex this morning, Joyce McFarland. Current staff member Amy Veach, who is just now beginning her second year with us, has been diagnosed with cancer and will have surgery this Thursday at Carolina which uh, Donnie Leonard can tell you is a great place to be treated for cancer. Deaths in the church family. Colonel David Hodgen died early yesterday morning at Wake Med. The service will be tomorrow at 11 o'clock at uh, Brown Wynn on St. Mary Street. Dr. McLeod will officiate. The uh, write-up is in the paper today. It's been a tough week in which we couldn't ignore death. Uh, prominent deaths in the church. Colonel Hodgen, a uh, member here for 35 years, Bill Roby, and Edna Hines. Uh, prominent in Presbyterian Church USA and uh, made a powerful impact here in less than a year's time. And our colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Reverend Wiley Smith, who died of cancer at the age of 55. They had a service for her, her yesterday in Wilmington that Sheila attended. Uh, Wiley was at my ordination service, and I'm almost positive at my installation service here. Were it not for her, I would not ever have thought to come to First Presbyterian. And I have a service this afternoon for a woman who wasn't a member. You may, she attended here some. You may have known her from real estate work, Trudy Cates. Uh, she also worked a few years at Capital Broadcasting. She died of cancer at the age of 56. So I thought, hey, cancer, death, where do I find a prayer with the power to match up to that? So I'm going to borrow a little prayer, this little six-line prayer from about 1,700 years ago prayer of Ambrose of Milan. It's in our uh, Book of Common Worship under uh, Prayers for Sickness. And then I'll borrow the words of Shirley Guthrie from the Declaration of Faith that we sometimes print on 
worship bulletins, and then I'm going to claim as our prayer uh, the words of the scripture you'll hear read this morning from Isaiah 43. So let us pray, beginning with the prayer of Ambrose of Milan. Oh Lord, you are medicine for me when I'm sick. You are my strength when I need help. You're life itself when I fear death. You are the way when I long for heaven. You are light when all is dark. You are my food when I need nourishment. Gracious God, we know, we believe that Christ has been raised from the dead. In his resurrection is the promise of ours. We're convinced the life you will for each of us is stronger than the death that destroys us. In the face of death, we grieve, yet in hope, we celebrate life. Nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we claim these words straight from the prophet's mouth. We will not fear, for God has redeemed us. You, great God, have called each of us by name. We belong to you. You are the Lord our God. You are our only Savior. We are precious in your sight. You love us. We will not be afraid because you are with us. And so we shall be your witnesses. Lord, we witness to our faith as we pray together in one voice, saying the prayer taught us by the one who called us friend, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come down and join me on the steps, please. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here today. Today is a special day in the life of the church. Does anybody know what we remember today? Anybody? You're going to hear about it in, um, well, I don't think you're having children's church today, but you're going to hear about it in the scripture as it is read. Um, it's the baptism of Jesus. Did you know that Jesus was baptized? He was baptized by John the Baptist. and. His cousin, exactly right, a relative of his. And because Jesus was baptized, we too are baptized. In our scripture lesson from the book of Luke, we learn that Jesus was baptized by John and that at that baptism, the Spirit of God descended like a dove upon Jesus. And that he, Jesus, um, God said to Jesus, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so one of the reasons that we baptize is because Jesus was baptized. Um, why do you think Jesus was baptized? He was without sin. Why do you think he was baptized? No, he wasn't a baby when he was baptized, but we do baptize babies a lot in our church. But Jesus was a grown man when he was baptized. Well, to show God's favor upon him, for people to know that um, he belonged to God. Baptism is a lot about belonging. We belong to God, and we belong to the family of God, which is the church. 
And this baptism was also the beginning of his public ministry, so it was a way to show that his ministry was blessed by God. So then why do you think we're baptized? Anybody know? Well, okay. Well, we're baptized because Jesus was baptized and to also show that we belong to God. That's what baptism shows and that we're part of God's family, the big family of God's people all over the world. And also because Jesus' life, what he did, is a model for how we can live as Christians. And so he was baptized, so we were baptized. Um, today we remember his baptism. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. Great God, we thank you for Jesus and for baptism. We thank you that we are part of your family. Amen. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Hear now the word of God. But now, Thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We turn now to Luke's record of the gospel, the third chapter, beginning our reading at the 15th verse. Listen again to God's word for us. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. And again, let us pray. 
Lord God of grace and goodness, pour out your Spirit upon us, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you have any idea what you are worth? Do you? Now some of you, when you hear that question, you'll begin immediately thinking about the balance in your checking account or the equity in your house or the total value of your investment portfolio. Because of our fixation on material things, when we think of our worth, the first thing that comes to mind is the sum total of our financial holdings. But that's not the only way to measure worth. Perhaps some of you have heard the rather quirky statistic which suggests that if the human body were separated into its various elements and minerals that we'd be worth about $4.50. At least that's the most recent number I've heard. That if the human body were broken down into our component elements and minerals, iron and potassium and the rest, that at current market value we would be worth just under $5.00 which means that inflation has hit everything. When, when I was a teenager, I first heard this and learned then that I was worth about $1.35, so we're going up in value. Though actually, according to the website at the Indiana University School of Medicine, there is another way to calculate the worth of a human body, and that is with the value assigned to the various body parts in organ transplant. According to their figures, and this seems astronomical, the human body is worth $45 million, with more than half of that being our bone marrow. At 1,000 grams of bone marrow at $23,000 per gram for a whopping $23 million. Now there's a risk in disclosing this sort of information, the risk being that some of you might try to sell your bone marrow on eBay which is illegal, I'm sure. But anyway, if we're to calculate the worth of a human being, the range is somewhere between $4.50 and $45 million, give or take. But again, that's really not what I'm talking about either. What gets closer to it is best understood when you hear about a family that was in one of my first churches, a family with two children, a boy and a girl, they are well into their adulthood now, but I knew them during their middle school and high school years. And their mother taught them a way of thinking about themselves, which was intended to remind them something important about themselves. When they thought of who they were, when they thought of their identity, this is what they were to say about themselves, to themselves. Uh, their names were Ansley and Keith, and when Ansley thought of herself, she was to say, I'm Ansley, a person of worth. And when Keith thought of himself, he was to say to himself, I'm Keith, a person of worth. Now, they weren't supposed to introduce themselves like this to people. They weren't supposed to go to school and introduce themselves to their teachers by saying, Hi, I'm Ansley. I'm a person of worth. Though, isn't that how we'd like our teachers to think of our children? No, this was to be an internal reminder, a reminder to her children that they had value, that their lives mattered. And as she sent them into a world where some children lose their sense of well-being or base their sense of well-being on being accepted by their peers, she wanted them to know that they were persons of worth and they didn't have to embrace the latest fads or, or be at the center of attention or wear the right clothes or drive the right cars or have the right things in order to gain approval or to feel good about themselves. She wanted them to know before they went out into that world that they were children of worth, that they were valued, that they were loved, that they counted for something. 
Now that way of calculating worth has nothing to do with the accumulation of riches or the acquisition of things. In fact, the accumulation of riches and the acquisition of things can actually get in the way of this sense of worth. For it can actually cheapen us because if our worth is tied to our financial value, we've simply become a commodity whose value rises and falls with the market. When the truth about us is that we are children of God, whose value is calculated another way. We began with an important question, do you know what you are worth? It's actually a difficult question to answer because the truth is we don't assign our own worth. Think of it this way, if you have a house to sell, who ultimately decides what it's worth? Now you may get a realtor or an appraiser to come tell you what they think it's worth and they might compare your house to other comparable properties in the area and they might come up with a number and then you take that number and because of what you think of the house and your emotional attachment to it you might increase that number and and come up with a price that you think your house is worth but ultimately isn't it in the hands of the buyer to determine the value of your home for ultimately, something is worth only what someone is willing to pay for it. For the price is too high, the buyer will look elsewhere. Or maybe you've heard of a situation where the buyer was so enamored of a house that they agreed to pay more than the asking price. They decided it was worth more than the seller thought it was. So when we begin thinking about what we are worth, it's important to remember that ultimately that determination is made by someone else. We are worth what we are worth to them. And so it becomes important for us to decide whose opinion we will trust. When we begin to think about what we are worth, it's important whose opinion about us we believe. And it will come as no surprise to you that when you begin to think about your own worth as a human being, I think you should pay attention most of all to God. That's what Jesus did, of course. Lots of people had lots of opinions about Jesus, some good, some not so good. He was admired as a teacher, as a healer, a worker of miracles, a friend to the outcast, but he was also reviled as a blasphemer, a violator of the law of God, a troublemaker. He was derided for hanging around with the wrong sorts of people. He was accused of leading people away from the traditions of their fathers. He was reminded that he was a teacher without credentials, that he had no standing, and that while other rabbis gathered around them, the students from the very best families in town, his followers were fishermen and tax collectors. Everybody had an opinion about Jesus. Still do. But the opinion that gave him his identity and reminded him of who he was was the opinion he heard rendered on the day of his baptism. You are my beloved son. With you I'm well pleased. Now when you've heard such a thing from God, from God, all other opinions, all other ways of measuring ourselves and being measured, all those other opinions sort of fade into the background. For when the heavens open up and you hear the words, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased, well, no other opinions really matter anymore. When you know what God thinks of you, and when you know how God values you, what else do you need to know? So let me ask my question again. Do you know what you're worth? 
Well, if we operate on the assumption that God's opinion of us is the only one that really matters, it would be important to know what God thinks of us. And I know it's been a while since our Old Testament text was read, and I don't know if you were listening. Maybe you let it drift right by you. But if you were listening, this is what God said about you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you, and the flames shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, and here's the kicker, you are precious in my eyes, and honored, and I love you, fear not. For I am with you. That, in a nutshell, is God's opinion of you. It's what God thinks of you. You are beloved. You are known by name. You are precious to God. When you begin to ponder your worth and your value, this is the place to begin because this is the only opinion that ultimately matters. That the Lord God of heaven and earth has declared that you are precious to him. Which means that despite what you think of yourself, And despite what other people think of you, God has drawn the conclusion that you are of inestimable value to him, that you are loved. You hear a lot of talk about the inherent worth of people, inherent worth meaning that we have worth in and of ourselves, but I'm not sure we do. We have worth not in and of ourselves, but because the one true God values us. In the end, God gets to decide what has worth. And God has decided that we do. Sometimes it boggles my mind that God has come to this conclusion. But he has. He says so himself. And do you remember what I said earlier? That the value of something is really based on what someone else is willing to pay for it? Well, the table spread before us today is a reminder that God has paid dearly for us. That in a remarkable show of extravagance, God has given his son for us. And remember now, this is the son at whose baptism it was declared, you are my beloved. But now for us, this beloved son was offered as sacrifice. A sacrifice we remember today with humility and gratitude and awe. You see, we live in a world where human beings are regularly demeaned and cheapened and ignored and discounted where human beings too often think too little of themselves and of one another. Today, here at this table, we are reminded what God thinks of us. Here, we are reminded that we are precious. Here we are reminded 
what we are worth. Thanks be to God, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. We continue to respond to God's word read and proclaimed by giving ourselves to God and symbolically at this time giving our gifts to God with our morning tithes and offerings.
Gracious God, there's a poem that says about offerings, this is what we think of you. But Lord, the truth is, we're banking everything on you. We trust you with our very lives. Help us to draw closer in faith and discipleship so that we might hear your voice saying to each of us, with you, I am well pleased. Amen. Though we often try to go it alone, we are made for communion. We have been made to be in communion with God and in communion with each other. And here at the Lord's table is where that communion becomes possible. It is where we are given a gift that binds us with the eternal and binds us together with the body of Christ. Jesus invites us to this table as he invited his disciples to this table to provide them strength for the journey, to sustain their faithfulness, that they might bear witness to his grace and his goodness all their days. Come to this table at Christ's invitation and taste and see that the Lord is good. Would you join with me in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, great God. You sent into the world the eternal light, the light of Christ, the Word made flesh. Your light is strong, your love is near. May we stay near our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you anointed at his baptism with the Holy Spirit, revealing him to be your beloved Son. Gracious God, keep us, your children, born of the water and the Spirit, faithful in your service, that we may rejoice to be called children of God through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, Holy is his name. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat at table with his disciples and he took bread and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples as we ministering in his name give it to you. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And Jesus said, take and eat. After the same manner, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
the cup of the new covenant. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have so greatly loved us and mercifully redeemed us. Give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills, and our pleasures. Works a continual thanks offering to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We have been given our identity by a God who calls us and sends us. A God who calls us to be His holy followers and sends us into the world bearing witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go out into the world trusting and believing that you have a holy and sacred purpose for you have a holy and sacred calling from a God who knows you by name and in whose sight you are precious. Now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessings of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you with all those you love and God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen.